Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. What? This is the first atomic bomb successfully tested by the UK in 1952. Hey guys, um, the original link to the video, hi, uh, top of the description, below that link to the Discord. Love to have you. Imperial War Museum's great channel. Why did Britain develop nuclear weapons? I don't know. I don't know, but that's what I'm here to learn. Let's go. It made Britain the third nuclear... It's a big this boom. is the first atomic bomb successfully tested by the UK oh. in 1952. It made Britain the third nuclear power in the world, and to this day, Britain maintains its nuclear arsenal. But in fact, Britain was one of the first countries involved in the development of atomic bombs. They began research on nuclear weapons as early as 1940. The scientific group known as the Maud Committee was established in 1940 to determine the feasibility of using nuclear fission to create an atomic bomb. The following year, the committee produced a report which demonstrated that this was indeed possible. The so-called Tube Alloys Programme was set up to develop the idea. However, Britain did not have the resources, equipment or materials to do this alone and the country was under attack from German bombing. Britain signed an agreement with the United States in 1943 to share all nuclear research and development with each other and Tube Alloys was merged with America's existing programme, the Manhattan Project. Their first successful nuclear test on the 16th of July 1945 ushered in the nuclear age. 500 million pounds worth of Allied effort has come to fruition and the greatest single force for good or evil ever created by man has been launched on the... Sorry, I just think that the 1940s speech is so comical. And here we see the 800 pound blast of the front... <laughs> World. Its single force for good or evil ever created by man has been launched on the world. Less than a month later, atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The devastation revealed that Britain and the United States had created a weapon of unparalleled destructive power. With the end of the Second World War, Britain's former allies of the US and the Soviet Union now found themselves opposed along ideological lines. The United States had shown the Soviet Union their hand by releasing their superweapon, and fear was growing that Soviet scientists would soon develop their own. To try to prevent Soviet spies from obtaining information relating to nuclear technology, the United States introduced the Atomic Energy Act, also known as the McMahon Act, in 1946, which severed ties of... Let me go back five seconds so I don't... Do you think if World War II was won by conventional means you know if a nuclear weapon was not developed in use and the world war ii was ended without it do you think there would be more big large-scale wars between big powers in the latter half of the 20th century because there isn't that mad mutually assured destruction uh thing the atomic energy act also known as the mcmahon act in 1946 which severed ties of britain and would transfer all nuclear development into civilian not military hands. Britain now needed to make a choice, take a step back and allow the United States to cement itself as the only Western nuclear power or develop its own atomic bomb to stand as an aggressor on the world stage. Britain chose the latter and set to work under the name High Explosive Research. Despite post-war reconstruction being at the forefront of British people's it's minds, it's worth noting here that rationing did not end until the early 1950s. High explosive research was seen as a Labour government priority, especially once the Soviet Union... I just think that high explosive research is putting it very lightly. Explosive research was seen as a Labour government priority, especially once the Soviet Union successfully tested their own atomic bomb in 1949. Churchill came back into power in Thank 1951, God. and the UK had plans to test its first weapon, a 25... It's like hearing the Soviet Union develop an atomic bomb reawakened like a dormant ah in 1951 and the uk had plans to test its first weapon a 25 kiloton Sorry. plutonium implosion bomb the uninhabited montebello islands located around 80 miles off the northwest coast of australia were chosen as the test site and the project was named operation hurricane looks like an australia ostrich. had agreed to allow britain to use and guys um aren't nuclear weapon explosions less radio spreading radioactive bad stuff than 
like a meltdown at a at a nuclear power plant because you have all of the fuel in the power plant that's converting the water to steam and when it melts down then all of, and in a, in a bomb it's it's like ex, it's ex, it's the nuclear material in the bomb is going into the explosion itself and so although there's is that correct and the project Sorry. was named operation hurricane Australia had agreed to allow Britain to use the islands, hoping that their willingness might lead to a supply of nuclear energy for its population. On the 3rd of October 1952, the first atomic bomb was detonated on board the ship HMS Plym, which was moored in a lagoon on the islands. The impact of the explosion left a crater six metres deep and 300 metres wide on the seabed. With the successful test, Britain has secured a place at the top table with the other nuclear superpowers. But Operation Hurricane had come at a cost, an estimated 150 million pounds, billions of pounds in today's money. Imagine, so that was exploded on a boat on the water surface. I don't know what the depth was where it was, but regardless of the depth, being able to blow out all of the water and then also create a crater on the bottom of the seabed, uh, nuclear explosions are insane. But the impact of this test and subsequent tests throughout the 1950s was not just financial. In the mid-1980s, the McClelland Royal Commission found that nuclear fallout had serious and long-lasting effects on those involved in the testing and the indigenous populations in Australia. The British and Australian governments have paid some compensation to those affected, but discussions remain live and investigations are ongoing. Nuclear warfare presented new technological challenges. Jet bombers were needed to carry and deliver nuclear weapons at long range, high altitudes and speed. Hey, this led to the development of the V-bombers, consisting the of the Valiant, the Vulcan the and the Victor. V-bomber bomb bays were designed to carry Recently. a free fall bomb called Blue Danube, the first UK built nuclear deterrent. I need to stop talking, Jesus Vulcan Christ. And the Victor. V-bomber bomb bays were designed to carry a free fall bomb called Blue Danube, the first UK-built nuclear deterrent. A Vickers Valiant from 49 Squadron painted an anti-flash white, which was thought to protect the aircraft and its crew from thermal radiation, successfully released the weapon on the 11th of October 1956 and became the first RAF aircraft to drop an atomic bomb. Jesus. From 1962 to 1969, Britain's primary nuclear deterrent was the Blue Steel Missile. But by this time, the high altitude V bombers were becoming. From 1962. Is that the explosion? It looks like the sun. To 1969, Britain's primary nuclear deterrent was the Blue Steel Missile. But by this time, the high altitude V bombers were becoming increasingly vulnerable to air defense missiles. Launched from a standoff position outside the range of enemy air defenses, Blue Steel could fly as a small, pilotless plane. However, its unreliability and limited range meant that Blue Steel was already out of date when it entered service in 1963. This aircraft behind me, the Avro Vulcan B-2, was armed with the Blue Steel missile when serving at RAF Scampton and RAF Cottesmore at the height of the Cold War. By the way, guys, if you want to see my reaction to uh, an Imperial War Museum's video on this plane, I, I uh, reacted to one a few days ago. When serving so. at RAF Scampton and RAF Cottesmore at the height of the Cold War. It was kept in a constant state of readiness known as Quick Reaction Alert. This Blue Steel missile was acquired by Imperial War Museums in 1978. In 1952, the US tested its first thermonuclear bomb. It was a thousand times more powerful than the atom bomb dropped on Hiroshima, with 10.4 megatons of TNT, producing a four miles wide mushroom cloud. In comparison, the bomb dropped on Hiroshima was just 15 kilotons. The Soviet Union successfully tested its first Sorry, thermonuclear Mom. weapon in 1953, and once again, Britain was not that far behind. On schedule, Britain dropped its own H-bomb over Christmas Island on the 8th of November, 1957. If anyone can tell me the main difference between a thermonuclear and atom bomb, I'd appre really appreciate it. With a yield, own H-bomb over Christmas Island on the 8th of November, 1957, with a yield of over a megaton. Both atomic and thermonuclear weapons were tested over Christmas Island and Malden Island as part of Operation Grapple. During the tests, British servicemen on the ground reported that the flash of light was so bright, 
even though they were facing away from the blast and had their hands over their eyes, that they could see the bones in their hands. That's For not miles good. miles beyond the impact. There... Yeah. Yikes, that, that can't be good. Eyes, that they could see the bones in their hands. For miles beyond the impact zone, birds, fish, and other marine life perished. Jesus. The long-term effects of radiation contamination on the servicemen and the island's inhabitants are still being researched, but they include an array of serious health issues, not just on those present during the tests, but passed down through subsequent generations. In 1957, the British tested their first uh, hydrogen bomb. I happened to be there as one of two American representatives. We were not at all privy to the design of the bomb. There was no exchange of detailed information whatsoever. So I tried to estimate the yield of the bomb. The British didn't even tell Guys, us. I, I need to ask. I thought that the dangerous radiation that you could get radiation poisoning with or just exposure to radiation has to do with fallout, which is carried by the wind. Like, I, I thought it was a sort of dust. But according to that, they, they could, they seemed to get an x-ray almost immediately as the blast went off. And so, my, my question is, how can you get harmed by radiation, which is I'm, why I'm assuming they could see their bones in their hands. If, if I, I thought radiation doesn't go that, uh, that quick. Did that make sense? We were not at all privy to the design of the bomb. There was no exchange of detailed information whatsoever. So I tried to estimate the yield of the bomb. The British didn't even tell us that. And I did the best I could trying to put my hand out and measure with my fingers the size of the fireball. And I was surprised at how small it was. And so I formed the opinion that the British were not on the right track, that they hadn't yet got what we call the Teller Ulam design. I later learned Teller I was wrong, Ulam. and they just simply had built it too small. And it was, I now believe, a, a quite sophisticated approach to the question. The break in the Manhattan Project was not the end of US-UK collaboration on nuclear weapons. From the end of the Second World War, the US had held some of its bomber force in bases across Europe so that its aircraft would be in range of the Soviet Union. In 1953, the United States... Do you guys think that was too provocative? Um, was that too much of an aggressive approach by the US? Um, just right away putting nuclear weapons publicly in, into... a you know. committed nuclear weapons to its NATO allies, establishing a nuclear presence in Europe. Then, in 1958, the US-UK Mutual Defense Agreement was signed. Britain and the United States were now able to exchange nuclear materials, technology, and information once again. And it wasn't long before Britain was entirely reliant on America for its nuclear weapons. To maintain its place as a global nuclear power, pressure was mounting on Britain to create its own ballistic missile to replace the nuclear deterrent carried by the V-bombers. However, Britain's attempt to create an IRBM, an intermediate range ballistic missile in the form of Blue Streak, was canceled in 1960 before entering production due to escalating costs. Britain turned to its American allies and ordered a series of US-made Skybolt ALBMs, air-launched ballistic missiles. Unfortunately, due to continued complications, Skybolt was cancelled in 1962, and Britain's nuclear deterrent relied on blue steel until Polaris. Polaris was an American-designed, submarine-launched, intercontinental ballistic missile, which entered service with the Royal Navy in 1968. Launched from underwater, the Polaris maintained a threat to the enemy even if a surprise nuclear attack had destroyed land-based nuclear force. The missiles were developed at Aldermaston and were carried by four British Resolution-class nuclear submarines. Each submarine held 16 missiles. I think the nuclear submarine is just the ultimate deterrent because even the small chance is like, all right, take out every bit of infrastructure and you destroy all nuclear capable launch sites in the country, they've still got a submarine and they're gonna at least punch you back once, even if you even if you uh 
destroy Alaris them. Alaris became Britain's main nuclear deterrent for the remainder of the Cold War, and the V-bombers were withdrawn from their nuclear role. Behind me is a Polaris A3TK. It has a Chevrolet warhead, a later modification designed to increase the potential of Polaris being able to penetrate Soviet anti-ballistic missile defenses. This missile is a drill version used by the Royal Navy for practice. The acronym AIM stands for Active Inert Missile. This means that it contains all of the working parts necessary for training, but no nuclear such as electrical stuff. systems, but cannot be launched. The need to scale oh. back nuclear tests was recognized early on. From November 1958 to September 1961, the US, UK and USSR even observed an informal moratorium on nuclear tests. But nonetheless, testing and development continued David? to escalate. In 1961, the world's largest ever nuclear weapon was detonated by the Soviets, a 57-megaton H-bomb called Tsar Bomber. The mushroom cloud was 37 miles high. We thought at the time, and I think it's been confirmed by the Russians since, that if that bomb had been built in a standard fashion, if, it, if there had been no attempt made to reduce the radioactivity, it would have yielded 100 megatons. So we are Guys, I think that the big one that the U.S. set off earlier on in the video was four miles in diameter. They said that was 37. ...made to reduce Almost the radioactivity. It would have yielded 100 megatons. So we always thought of that as the only test essentially of a 100 megaton bomb. We oh my God, that would take out Rhode Island. That would be, that, that mushroom cloud would essentially just, all right, yeah, Rhode Island's not that big, okay? But still, it would, all right. Oh, that Sakharov tried to prevent the explosion of that bomb. And Khrushchev apparently said, you're a brilliant scientist and you understand those things, but I understand politics. Kennedy's response is also interesting. Kennedy resisted the idea of an immediate American response. That is, an American test. Eventually, that, that became obvious that the Russians were just, there was no containing them. And we essentially did the same thing. We went and, you know, we got bombs from wherever we could find them Bigger. and took them to Nevada and shot them just in order to respond to these Russian tests. It was a crazy period. I say this all the time. It's so true, though. The more I learn about international relations, you know, relations... I hate the buzzword. It's just relationships between internet from between countries. Okay, that's international relations. Right? Is so point on similar to to individual like how countries act with each other through history. Like this is just it's no better or worse than how individuals act with each other. Does anyone see what I'm saying? It's just oh they did it. We we got a ah. Oh. It's fascinating. Nuclear testing reached a global peak in 1961 to 1962, when 340 megatons were detonated in the atmosphere by the United States and the Soviet Union. In 1963, after years of negotiations, the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which prohibited nuclear weapons tests in the atmosphere, outer space and underwater, was signed by Britain, the United States and the Soviet Union. Other countries followed, but some have still never signed it. In 1980, the British government announced its plans to replace the aging stock of Polaris missiles and ordered the American Trident II D-5 missile system two years later. Trident went into service with the Royal Navy in 1994 and remains Britain's main nuclear deterrent. Four Vanguard-class nuclear-powered submarines carry Trident, each with the capacity to hold up to eight missiles. At least one nuclear-armed submarine is on constant patrol. The nuclear age was indeed a period of escalation avoidance. Summits were organized and treaties were signed with the aim of preventing all-out nuclear war. Meanwhile, public dissent was a consistent presence in the UK. The Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, or CND, was founded in 1957 to advocate for a global ban on nuclear weapons. After the signing of the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in 1963, CND membership fell but it had a resurgence in the 1980s, largely owing to the US and British governments stating that American cruise missiles would be based in Britain. Today, CND actively campaigns against Trident, NATO, and nuclear power. The British government states that it is committed to the long-term goal of a world without nuclear weapons, and it remains dedicated to the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, which came into force in 1970. I don't think that's ever gonna happen. 
Nonetheless, it maintains a constant nuclear deterrent, stating that it is required to preserve peace, prevent coercion, and deter aggression. In January 2020... Okay, but that's always going to be a threat. How can you be for a world that where no one has nuclear weapons and then state this as your reasoning for having one right now? Preserve peace, prevent coercion, and deter aggression. Um, the only way nuclear weapons are going to be gone is if p humans find an even more destructive weapon than that. It, the, the, the mere concept that you're, even if everyone passes, passes like, all right, everyone, no nuclear weapons, you'd be very stupid to get rid of your nuclear weapons. Yeah, just the mere possibility. I mean, governments have the most insane, um playbooks and plans already written out for the most illogical thing uh, th there's no way that a country would ever trust other countries to not have one so that they wouldn't have one themselves i i, I like the concept but trying to think of it in reality there it, there's no scenario where i see countries giving up the most powerful means to either threaten or ward off another country. I, 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 In January maybe I'm too pessimistic. The Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons came into force, an international agreement to prohibit nuclear weapons. To date, Britain and other NATO members have not voted, except for the Netherlands, which voted against. Britain will maintain its continuous at-sea deterrence, and it is estimated that the Vanguard-class submarines carrying Trident missiles will be replaced by a Dreadnought-class fleet by the 2030s. And these will host existing Trident missile stock. Great video as always, guys. Am I being too pessimistic here? Okay. In what world? Um, let's all get rid of nuclear weapons. <laughs> all that would... How? Okay. Uh, it's one of those things that, yeah, it's a great concept. It's kind of like, you know, saying that you're for world peace, okay? Well, who isn't for world peace, okay? The reality is, is that there are people who you don't like in the world or that go against your values that might threaten you and you need somebody to defend yourself. And so I'm much more pessimistic on that. I, I don't think that until a, a more powerful weapon is created that nuclear weapons will ever be done out with. They're, they're just too good of a deterrent. Um, really interesting video, guys. Uh, let me know if I, if you'd answer my questions, I'd really appreciate it or any comments in general. Um, I'm an expert on none of this. So if I was sounded too confident in something, I'm, I'm not. Okay. So I, I try to learn. I love to learn about this stuff and it's entertaining, but also I, I, I look forward to reading your guys' comments. Okay. So feel free to, uh, tell me if I'm wrong somewhere as you always do rightfully. I'll see you guys next time. Bye guys.